Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Book Lounge. Today, we are talking about the book Women and Money by Susie Orman. Your hosts, as always, are myself, Corinne Ritchie. And me, Tom Butler Bowden. So every week, what we do is choose a great nonfiction book. And we uh, look at it, discuss it, dissect it. Um, I'll give my take on the book, uh, why I think it's still relevant and, uh, you know, why you should perhaps go and read it or listen to it yourself. Yep. And I'll weigh in on the book and update you on the latest news about the title and the author. And just a reminder that the best in-depth explorations are on our Book Insights episodes, but here in the Book Lounge, it's just an informal chat about the book of the week. So this week, we are bringing on financial bloggers. They are married millennials who paid off six figures in student loan debt uh, and now run the popular Instagram account Rich by Intention. Please welcome Angie and RJ. Hi. Thanks, guys. Hi, Corinne. Hi, Tom. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, excited to join. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, welcome. So, uh, Corinne mentioned a little bit your background here, but maybe fill us out a little bit more on, you know, on, on your journey to, uh, to to your popular Instagram account and um, what sort of sparked you to get into the whole personal finance area. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for asking. And it started, it started right before we got married, we got married in 2017. And um, before we, you know, came together as a married couple, um, we really started getting uh, intentional with our finances, and we wanted to quickly pay off our debt. Um, I had uh, close to 90,000 student loan debt. Angie had close to about 30, 36,000 in, in student loan debt. And we knew that when, when you get married, um, money is, is, is sometimes one of the number, number one issues why people get divorced. So it was very important to us that we change that um, issue and also just be intentional with our marriage. So, you know, we came up with a plan to pay off our debt. And, you know, shortly after we got married, um, a little bit over a year, uh, we paid off um, the six figures in debt. And once we actually paid it off, you know, it was it was like this huge weight was lifted off our shoulders, but it also inspired us to help other married couples, help other uh, individuals as well, pay off debt and, and let them know that it's possible. And we did a actually a um, financial like seminar uh, where we were talking to college students regarding paying it off and, and recent grads. And when me and Angie did this, did this program, um, we knew that we wanted just to continue helping people. Uh, and from there, you know, we created Rich by Intention mm -hmm. and, you know, we've been helping people uh, each and every day, uh, just change their financial lives. Great. Super inspirational. Yeah. I'm sure it's super relatable. I definitely know lots of um, couples that I, so I went to a private university and when we came out, I definitely know lots of couples that were in that situation with, you know, uh, six figures of, of student loan debt as well. Yeah, I would just add to what um, RJ said and, you know, just coming together as a married couple and working as a team, I would say, you know, having that goal to pay off six figure debt with it as newlyweds as you know a year in our to in, into our marriage um was such a lofty goal um and we didn't expect to pay it off so quickly right in under a year um we really thought we were going to be about it was going to take about three years um to pay it off but i think when you just come together and you're on a mission together as a married couple um you can really conquer anything you know if you're doing it together so um it was one of the I would say one of the best experiences um, in our marriage, you know, and just achieving that goal together um, was just such a great thing for us, a great milestone. And now we're able to like, like RJ said, help others, um, build, you know, just change their legacy like we did. That's incredible. And under a year. Okay. I'm sure all of the listeners are going to want to know, give us the condensed version of what was most, uh, what, what helped you, like, how did you do it? Like, what were the, the biggest things that helped you to accomplish, you know, paying all of that off in such a short amount of time? 
Yeah. I mean, like I said, I think one is communication, obviously with RJ and me, um, you know, coming together with a plan, like we would have weekly budget meetings where we would look at our debt, look at our monthly income and really just create a plan each month to conquer the debt. Not only that, right. Um, we actually, um, I, I think I mentioned just budgeting, right? So we would budget, budget, the budget was a huge component to our um, success with paying off our debt. Um, so like I said, we would come together, talk about our money, talk about our budget and the plan that we had to pay down the debt. Um, I would also say that we, we called up uh, <laughs> bill bill uh, vendors or like, um, you know, our utility companies to see if there was anything that they could do to, um, you know, uh, lessen the, the, the rent payment, if you will, or the water bill or the electric bill, you know, and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. But I think we took the initiative to really just ask and see if there was anything that they could do um, with any bills. Yeah. And then, and then other things that we did, uh, we sold, we sold some of our furniture. Mm -hmm. um, we took on extra jobs as well. Yes. I think that was a, a key component. Mm -hmm. Or we left our current firms and went to, and, and got either promotions or uh, new jobs also to increase our yeah. income, which was very vital as well. Mm -hmm. And, and then also, um, like the rent conversation, right? We signed a, a longer lease on our rent mm -hmm. so that our rent was uh, substantially discounted uh, mm -hmm. to sign a long-term lease. So we we attacked it in every aspect. Yep. Um, we, we cooked, we didn't eat out. We <laughs> fat, we got creative with our dates. You know, we were newlyweds, right? So, um, you know, after the honeymoon, we kind of just, you know, uh, it was beans and rice, if you will, you know, like we cooked dinners, we found deals to go out to do different activities. We shared meals if we had to, if we did go out to eat. Um, so we really took, did some sacrifices, I think, to help us pay off this debt, you know? And um, yeah, so it took some, it took a lot of uh, lifestyle changes to help us get this out of our life, the yeah. debt out <laughs> of our life, but it worked. Yeah, and I think we were so focused on it, like every, mm -hmm communication that we had was like you know how can we reduce our expenses mm -hmm. how can we increase our income mm -hmm. how can we make more income what can we sell what can we do yeah. um that we were so much on the same page and had so much synergy as my as angie had had a reference we were expecting to pay this off in three years yeah but our energy or our fire to pay this off was so strong that we ended up paying it in, in less than a year. And it was um, just amazing accomplishment and feeling. And it just mm -hmm. made us realize how strong our marriage was and how when you put intention behind something and take the steps and actions, which you can actually do, uh, impossible is nothing. Yeah. Well, I think it's great that we got um, a couple actually to talk about Susie Orman and her book, because one of her key themes is relationships and love and mm -hmm. Uh, women and relationships, money, etc. How it all works together. Um, Corinne, maybe you can just give an intro. You know, what what is the sort of big idea uh, of Susie's book, Women and Money? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, Women and Money is basically Susie Orman's response to um, what she sees as a, an alarming statistic, as a big problem. You know, so she sees that despite women making up more than half of the workforce, also more than half of college graduates. So she's seeing the education component is there, the workforce component is there, and uh, household incomes are 50% women are bringing them in. So she's seeing the representation in all these areas. And yet, despite all of those, um, she saw that women are still twice as likely than men to retire in poverty. And so she was trying to figure out, you know, if they're educated, they're working, they're bringing in money, why are women so much more likely to retire in poverty? And so this book sort of um, is all of the patterns that she saw in terms of what it is that leads to um, that statistic. And it's her efforts to try to combat those things. So she's giving advice specifically on um, money management issues that she sees that women tend to have more often than men tend to have. And, and also addresses some of the gender specific financial challenges that women face more often than men do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so thank you guys. Um, Angie, RJ, wh what is your take on this, particularly Angie? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, 
this book actually, you know, it's a few years old now. It's I think originally came out in 2007. Um, what is your take on, on Susie's point of view here? And do you think, you know, a lot has changed in the last, you know, 13 years or so? Yeah, I mean, you know, not all, you know, I definitely, <laughs> one, I'm a woman. Um, and so I can definitely understand and it definitely resonates with me, um, Susie's um, perspective on women and money. And it can be a difficult um, uh, relationship that women do have with money. I think oftentimes as women, um, you know, we're, we're not, we, we pay the bills, right? I think in a lot of homes, um, women manage the finances um, or a certain part of the finances, but not necessarily um, the wealth building part. And I say that, I mean that to say they'll handle paying the bills and, you know, paying, you know, buying the groceries and um, buying the kids' school supplies, but women don't always, they're not always involved in the wealth building part of it in terms of the saving and investing um, part of it. Not only that, um, I think women in general um, just have a hard time with, uh, you know, um, getting what they deserve um, when it comes to money, um, particularly within their careers. I know for myself, um, you know, it is, it can be a challenge um, when you um, do a lot of work. You know, women work very hard. Um, we go the extra mile. We do amazing, incredible things, right? Um, with the little that we're given. Um, but for some reason, women don't feel the confidence to um, ask for what they deserve in the workplace. They're afraid to negotiate um, and not having that negotiation conversation, um, whether it is when you're getting hired for a new job um, at a new company or having that um, negotiating negotiation conversation um, with your boss asking for a raise. Um, you know, where for whatever reason, women are afraid to just speak up and get the money that they deserve. And I think um, from Susie's perspective, you know, I think um, women in general, you know, I, I, I guess, you know, they don't like, they don't like to say no to things, right? They don't like, uh, um, there was a point that I wanted conflict. to make because I just listened to it. They don't like conflict, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. They're, they don't love conflict. Mm -hmm. um, they're kind of willing to just do what, you know, what's requested of them without causing too much friction. And I think a lot of times as women, we have to find that we have to dig in deep and just speak up because if we don't, um, we don't get um, what we, what we deserve. And I think men are more willing to speak up and, get the things, even if they don't deserve it, right? Mm. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, men just seem to have that confidence where they can just, um, you know, get whatever it is that they think that they want um, from a financial perspective and women have a hard time with that. Yeah, definitely. And I think like, just like you said, in the workplace, whether it's getting a promotion, getting a raise, getting hired at the correct um, rate, I think that we've seen statistically women do tend to have a harder time in those areas and even getting the job to begin with. Um, so that's one of those stats that's also, I find pretty alarming that um, women tend to only apply to jobs where they meet 100% of the qualifications, whereas men statistically will apply even if they only meet 60% of the cri criteria. Mm -hmm. um, so even just getting the job, we already see that discrepancy. So it's going to impact the, the financial piece for sure. Mm. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, and I mean, for the book, I found very interesting all the stuff she talks about relationships, um, actually. Um, yeah, you mentioned that, Angie, about the ability to say no to stuff. Um, and she, she links, um, she says something, or is it, when you make financial decisions with a view to saving a relationship, it never works. Mm -hmm. So she's saying that a lot of women sort of give in to their partners with a view to keeping them happy mm -hmm. to save the relationship. Yeah. yeah, with children mm -hmm. as well, like buying them stuff that you can't really afford and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I just found that interesting. And she relates to this thing of like having courage, speaking your truth. Um, 
so I just found that, um, you know, seeing things from, from that perspective, um, I hadn't necessarily come across it before in other personal finance books. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I wondered what you guys thought of that. Yeah, I think, I think women in general, like, <laughs> I know myself, I'm a mother, a new mother. Um, and you give so much of yourself to everyone, you pour out everything to everybody, and you barely have enough for yourself. Um, and so, you know, women do have a hard time saying no and setting those boundaries um, with their husbands, with their children, with their spouses or partners, um, with their family members. And sometimes you do have to find it within yourself to say no. Um, you know, when people ask you to borrow money, if it's your sister, your brother, it's okay to say no, right? Um, especially when your family, you and your family have a goal in mind to pay off debt or to invest, you know, for your child's um, college savings, you know, um, we definitely have to learn how to say no. And I think Susie definitely um, illustrated that well in her book that, you know, as women, you know, it's one thing to not only speak up at work, right, and ask for your raise, but you have to speak up within your own family and be willing to say no and be be willing to set boundaries um, around yourself um, and put yourself first sometimes um, so that you can, um, you know, uh, provide everything that you need for yourself before you give to others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, yeah and, and I just think, you know, we, we have a daughter and for me, it's important that she's assertive and, you know, the words that I, that we use with her, you know, instead of saying bossy, we say she's a leader um, from the beginning so that as she gets older, she knows um, to speak up, to be assertive, to say no to the, the right things so that she can say yes to the things that really matter to her. And as she get older, you know, the part of the negotiating or setting boundaries come natural and it's not something that she's hesitant about. So it's always important for me as a father to be intentional in terms of, you know, how my interaction with my daughter is and to make sure I'm, you know, really uh, teaching her to be a leader and to um, be comfortable in her own uh, home skin. Uh, Susie mentioned, you know, saying your name or, you know, um, being present and taking control of your destiny and those all things that are very important if you want to be successful in this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, RJ, I'd love to hear sort of the male perspective as well. Like we're addressing how women have tr trouble saying no when that family member, you know, needs to borrow money or when, you know, you're trying to have the, you're trying to make the most amazing Christmas ever for your children. And, you know, that temptation to spend more than, you know, would be financially viable for you. So, you know, I feel like dads have a lot of those same feelings when it comes to their kids and when it comes to their family of origin. Um, how, how do you do when it comes to that relationship part of money? Yeah, so I think the same arguments in terms of, you know, being able to say no, um, I think men, when they're married as well, will give in to their, their spouse as well in terms of like spending. And it's important that, you know, there, there are boundaries or there is communication to know that there's limits to how much we can spend in a household because of our goals that we have. Um, and that's important in any marriage that you have your annual goals, your five year, 10 year plus goals for your family. Because if you just say it to you know your spouse, hey, we can't spend without a goal behind it, then it's just gonna sound like you're trying to tell someone what to do. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the marriage, your partners, and you know, you're leading your, your house home together and you're trying to set the right example for your children. So, you know, a lot of times for myself, you know, I may have not been able to get, you know, everything I wanted growing up. And, you know, a lot of times when you get later in life, you're like, hey, I want to give my kids everything. And I think, you know, sometimes that can uh, cause even more damage to your child. So it's, it's a balance figuring out how much do you spend on your child and how much do you teach your child and how much do you allow them to figure out or learn on their own. And I think as us being parents, you know, we're going through those motions and, and really trying to find the right balance. Mm -hmm. I recommend, um, so my daughter's a teenager, one of these apps where you give them the allowance and then they have to, um, they can retain it for the next week or save something or they work out how much they can spend on their budget. And um, the technology is pretty good now in that kids can learn all about, you know, online savings, accounts, et cetera. 
Um, whereas in the past, it might have been, you know, a few dollars in your pocket or something. So there's a lot of resources now for kids. I, I wish that they would teach more personal finance in schools. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't, it's just one of these things I just don't understand mm -hmm. why, why schools don't teach that. I, I would even... So, yeah, I was, I was, I agree with you. I think it's great that technology, the technology is there to help encourage um, children to learn more about personal finances. But I would even say, you know, um, to the parents listening, um, to really start including children um, in the personal finance conversation. I know, you know, our daughter is very young, but, you know, it's as simple as kids learn so much from seeing, you know, and so, um, I think as much as kids can be involved with, you know, the weekly budget meeting, like I mentioned that RJ and I um, do, um, including them in that conversation, you know, is so important because they're going to take so much from that um, more than what we probably even can imagine just by being hearing the words, hearing the conversation that's being had about money um, and the family and, and whatnot. I know from my own experience, you know, my mother um, included me and, you know, at the time <laughs> we had checkbooks back then and she had to balance her checkbook and, you know, she included me in that. And I was maybe seven years old, maybe even six years old. And, you know, I actually saw her go through the process of balancing her checkbook and I asked questions and I thought we were poor. I'm like, wait, are we poor? There's no more money left. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's it's things like that that are that you're able to spark a conversation with your children to help them start learning about money. And I would say that that gave me a good foundation and a good healthy relationship with money, where um, you know I'm able to have you know delay gratification, right? I'm able to just save my money for something that I really want um, because I knew early on that money doesn't grow on trees, right? That you have a finite amount of money um, or resources that you have available to you. And um, that has to go to, you know, the household um, that has to go to a lot of other things that help you live the life um, that you're living. And I think children are smarter than we think. And they'll, they'll understand that, that, you know, you know, honey, we can't have, um, you know, we can't buy 15 gifts for Christmas this year, um, you know, that we have to, you know, save a little money. And I think kids will be respect receptive to that if you include them to in, in the conversation um, from the beginning. Absolutely. So I have elementary schoolers in third and fourth grade, and uh, they get a monthly allowance, $1 per year age they are. So they get like nine and 10 bucks right now. And uh, we were just at a national park and we went, you know, through the gift shop because you can't get out unless you walk through the gift shop. And because <laughs> they have been getting this allowance now for several years, they have a good sense of what things cost, what's affordable, what's not. And of course, they're loudly in front of the employees being like, why is everything so expensive in here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, guys, that's enough. Like, this <laughs> mug is $18. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they're understanding the concept, right, of money mm -hmm. and yeah. that things yeah. cost money and right. it's just not, you know, free to mm -hmm. just take all of these things. And so I think that's great that, you know, I think that you're starting your kids out on a, a good foundation and a healthy relationship with money so that they understand when they get older. Yeah, I think it's also it's not just um, budgeting. It's um, it's, you know, investing and, and mm -hmm. learning about stocks and shares and bonds and all all this other stuff um so i wanted to disentangle something here because susie orman i mean a fair bit of the book um i think it's a bit outdated now to be honest she talks about women disliking money and not wanting to have anything to do with investments and stuff i think that's changed quite a bit since she wrote it um but another thing um, you might have a view on that, but another thing that's arisen is um, this idea that I, I've read a few studies that apparently women have a less uh, wish or capacity for risk in investing, um, that men are more willing to take risk. And historically, if you take more risk over a long period of time, you get a greater payoff. Um, so I wondered if this is the question, is this something that is just cultural conditioning or is it something that has changed? Um, 
Angie, AJ, uh, RJ, what do you think about this? So, so yeah, so I saw that, I saw that study, but there also was another study that women are less likely to take their money out. Um, so, and, and basically selling at the wrong time. Mm. So that's a, that's a key component of it, right? Because the, the, the name of the game or the message is to have a long-term investment perspective. And when you look at it between men and women, you'll see women, they'll stay in investment longer. There's less opportunity of them selling at the wrong time, which gives them a higher chance of their uh, return being higher. So the mm. times have changed. Um, I do, I do agree and believe that women are more um, conservative in terms of investments, but I do do believe that once they do start investing, that they will invest for the long term, right? As long as there is a clear goal for what what uh, women are investing in, and that's the that's a great um, uh, skill to have, right? Or a great core um, competency to have, um, and also when it comes to planning women are more on board to do more planning than men. So when you tie your investments with your goals, it changes like the perspective, right? It's like, hey, I'm investing for the future not, hey, I'm looking to get the next Tesla or Bitcoin or, you know, cryptocurrency. So it changes the, yeah. the conversation, right? Because, you know, when you throw out those type of names uh, immediately, right? If you're risk, if you're risk averse, you're going to be like, I'm, I'm not going to invest in something like that. But if I can just get something consistent, over time, that makes more sense, right? Because the story is more um, compelling and it's something that is uh, more consistent. So, so yeah, times are definitely are changing. Um, I think the internet had a lot to do with that. Um, you know, these iPhones that we have and we have access to all this information and there's just a huge um, amount of resource in the personal finance space where there actually are women who are leading this. I would yeah. argue that there are more women in the personal finance space, but in the investing space, there's more men. And in the personal finance um, space, they talk a lot more about index funds, ETFs, you know, mm -hmm. dollar cost averaging, you know, taking advantage of their 401k. And that's the important starting, starting point, right? Like it's the gateway to investing, right? Once you start doing your 401k, once you start, you know, just dollar cost averaging, then you start maybe looking at other things, but you need to at least have that, that core um, foundation. And, and that's what uh, a lot of women are getting today in form of personal finance space. Mm, yeah. 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 And then when you see like these meme stocks where it's more buy quick, sell quick, I, all the Reddit guys, those tend to be the bros <laughs> of the world. Not so much the women <laughs> that are like, give me the GameStop stock. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just imagine a, you know, a guy in a, in a little flat with the curtains drawn, you know, that's <laughs> or the GameStop traders. I don't know. I, I can't see women doing that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because even like with the whole AMC and like mm -hmm. cryptocurrency, like my wife, she hasn't brought it up that much, but it's been on my mind a lot. So mm -hmm. it's just like, it's like just a different mindset, right. In terms of, oh man, like Dodge coin or Bitcoin that I miss out on it. Me, even though I know that I'm not going to, necessarily put money into it it's still like hmm interesting right in my perspective but angie's like hey we, we still you know maxing out 401k we're still investing yeah. every month like mm -hmm. and i think that's where women come in right like we're more of the um you know uh I think we're more of the planners. We're more of the, and I, I don't, I don't mean to generalize women again. Like I think we're all very different. Women have different roles um, in different families, et cetera. And I, I respect that. Um, but I, I would say for the most part, you know, women are planners and we have our eye on the long term. Um, where I think sometimes men are a little bit more um, short sighted, uh, short -sighted um, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, and so, yeah, and I think, I think that's okay, right? And I think, you know, like, like RJ was saying, like, um, women are getting into the investment space, you know, like, I do think Susie Orman's. Um, you know, that part of her book is a little outdated because I think, you know, women, women, one thing that women do well is, you know, they'll educate themselves on a topic, right? If they don't know something, they will seek out the education, they'll seek out the resources and make sure that they have the information um, before kind of jumping in. And so I think a lot of women are doing that today more than, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, because we do have, you know, access to so much in the personal finance space. Yeah, Good yeah, point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one other theme I just wanted to touch on, um, 
in the book, which I liked a lot, is this um, idea of ordering your life and your finances. Mm. Um, she's got, Susie's got this thing, the eight qualities of a wealthy woman. And one of them is this, uh, she calls cleanliness. She doesn't mean like cleaning your house. It just means getting your affairs in order, all your paperwork, mm -hmm. knowing where, you know, the crumpled bills are and the, and the pocketbook and the invoices and everything. And um, throwing out, you know, clothes you're not wearing anymore. Um, having a filing cabinet. Um, I mean, I personally have find that to be very, very true. It's only when you start looking at all your paperwork, you realize, oh, that's not right, or I need to do something there. Um, so I don't know if this is necessarily a female thing or I don't Actually, know. Yeah, I'm like nodding my head along with you guys because um, I agree. I definitely think that's a female thing. I think, you know, women are more detailed <laughs> um, than men. We like to dig into the details. And like I said, I think we're the planners and we set order to the household. Um, and again, I'm not speaking for every household, but I think generally this is the role that women do have um, when it comes to, you know, managing the finances in their families. And we definitely try to organize things. I know for me, um, you know, I can give you an example. I'm usually the one that reviews the credit card statements. I review, I review the debit card statements and whatnot. And for whatever reason, I missed out on a couple of weeks. Um, and I noticed an, a payment for a gym that I have not been going to. I did not realize they were still charging me. And I'm like, oh my goodness, like, where did this come from? Yep. And so, so, you know, I think, I think that's the role we play because we're more into the details. And um, I think, you know, it's an important role as we set order to things, as we organize our home and our families and it's a once you get those things done once you get your ducks in a row it's so much easier to you know um just start out on the financial journey in general i know for even when we were paying off our debt you know i'm the i'm the person that had a um a grid on our refrigerator outlining you know how much money we need to pay off this specific month um to our to our debt and how much um we'll have left over etc you know and so i definitely think you know just once you're organized once you set your house in order um it's all the more easier to just start that um start that uh start your financial journey so agreed just to add to that um yeah, I'm not as organized as my wife uh, is, but um, you know, I do follow her <laughs> her process or her her plans that she has in place, and it does make it so much easier. That's why you know we're a team, right? We're a partnership, and you know where she's strong, you know I follow, and and where I'm strong, she follows, and and that's how we ultimately were able to pay off the six figure debt. Uh, but it's it's so important to have some structure, some system in place. Uh, with your money, right? Mm -hmm. You should treat your money as a business and especially a successful business. There's no successful business that doesn't have order or budget or a system in place for them to continue to grow. And that's what you want for your own personal life. So, you know, the one thing that, that how we look at it is that we treat it as a business. So we have the inflows, we have the outflows, we have the accountability, and that just allows us to know uh, exactly where our money is at all times instead of figuring out where it went. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, this is the point where we all give a, a mark out of five, what we thought of the book. Um, Corinne, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I loved this book. I, I really enjoyed it. It's one of those that um, I find really useful and relevant. It's, I, I would gift it in a heartbeat to, um, to anyone, male or female. I think it's, it's relevant to both. Um, and I, I like that it's more than just a here's what to do with your money type book. There's a lot of some real deep emotional stuff in there where she talks about yeah. self-worth and how that ties into money and, you know, your relationship. It's just a little bit of everything, but then all ties back to personal finance. So for me, it was great. Um, so, yeah, I give it five out of five bookmarks. Um, yeah. What well, do you what do we think? Uh, yeah, that's rare coming from you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it must be good. Yeah, Angie, RJ. 
Hmm. So I'm a, I'm a tough critic, um, but <laughs> fair, you know, I do not grade, grade on the curve. So, um, <laughs> so I mean, there, there's a lot of great things in this book. Some of it's out of date, so I'm not going to uh, fault it for that, right? Because it, it was written in a specific time. She did revise the book to include like the Me Too movement and mm -hmm. uh, as well. So mm -hmm. I would give it a four out of five. Yeah, I, I think I'd give it the same four out of five. Um, I think Susie did such an amazing job with this book. And, um, you know, I think um, Susie Orman is one of the pioneers um, in this space, um, especially for women. Um, and so I think, you know, her taking the, the lead and in initiating this conversation, this difficult conversation, I think, um, for many women um, is spot on. And so, you know, I definitely give her her kudos um, for that. So I, I did enjoy the book. Yeah. And I think the one biggest thing for me, like going through the book is just confidence is, is so important, mm -hmm. especially for our woman. We have to make sure that they're confident and they're comfortable and they're allow themselves to grow. So once again, you know, we have a daughter and, and it's so important that we pour, you know, confidence mm -hmm. and love into her at all times. So um, th that one part of the book that has that is, you know, the, the reason why anyone should read the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that part of the book as well. Basically, she's saying, as long as you have the essential things like, you know, love and some respect, uh, a job money is incredibly important. And um, a lot of people sort of dismiss that or put it at the back of their mind and say it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, so I like that bit of the book as well, that she really comes out and says, you know, just admit that it is. Um, yeah, I'll give it a... I... Yeah, go ahead. Right. No, I was just... Get... Sorry to interrupt you. I... I just wanted to add, because I think you said something so important that women, you know, we don't see money as important all the time. And it's like, you know, we have to realize that money gives you options, mm -hmm. you know, options for a better life for your family, um, options to pursue education, options to travel, options to do whatever it is that you want to pursue in your life. And it gives you security. Um, and I think if more and more women see it that way, that with money, they'll have options. Like we can't just be complacent. There's no need for us to be complacent, um, that we can do so much more if we have money. Think about how much you're able to give, you know, if you have the resources, if you have wealth, if you have money, think about the good that you can do. Um, and again, money isn't the end all be all, it isn't, um, but it puts you in a very specific position where you're able to help other people um, because I think a lot, like like in Susie's book, you know, women are givers, right? We are able to give a lot more, um, but we're also to provide options for our family. And I think that resonates with women very greatly um, because it all ties back um, to the family, I think, for a lot of women. Yeah, and then one last note, sorry guys, but um, the negotiating, I think I want to hone in that as well because every time you don't negotiate, you're like, if you look at it over a decade or 20 years, if you miss out a thousand every year, that's 20,000, 40 is 40,000. And, and don't forget about the raises and promotions. So uh, it's so important that when you get a job, I don't care what the job is, you ask for a dollar more at least, um, or you know, a thousand more, whatever that number is, you just ask for more because it's just gonna help you in the long run. And at first it is scary. I remember when I first graduated at college and I had no experience, but I still asked for more money and they said no, but I just got in the habit of actually doing it. And it's just, that's the practice. That's the practice that you want. You know, and you can easily yeah. open up a question by just saying, is there, is there flexibility in, in, in the compensation? And that's an easy yes or no. And you don't have to put yourself like, Hey, I want more money. You just access the flexibility and you hone that skill. And then you'll be making so much more money um, just by asking for more. And men do it all the time. So mm -hmm. I, I strongly advise to, to do it in every aspect of your life. Yeah, the worst that can happen is that you'll hear no, and then you'll be in the same position that you started in. So right. you yep. can only go up from there. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, if you don't get what you ask for in terms of extra money, you might get something else and say, mm -hmm. well, we can give you this or that. So yeah. yeah, I agree. Definitely. It's like a thousand, ten thousand million dollar question of, you know, is there flexibility in the compensation? So simple and you don't know the value of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I give this book a four because I love these personal finance books where 
they're very narrative based. I mean, Susie, I love the trajectory of her life. So, you know, she starts out as a waitress and then um, she gets talking to someone who lends her $20,000 to start her own restaurant. And then she loses the money that she's invested. And then she gets a job as a trainee at Merrill Lynch and goes on from there. And it's, she's totally self-taught. Um, you know, she can get anything from her family. Um, so I love just the fact that she can go from where she was to where she is now, you know, talk shows, podcasts, educating, you know, the US Army and stuff. Um, it's great. I mean, it, it, her style is a bit like Dave Ramsey, sort of like folksy and anecdotal, which is enjoyable. So whatever you're learning from this book, you know, it's like an interesting story for me. So mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it from that perspective. Uh, Corinne, what, what is Susie Orman up to at the moment? Yeah, so um, since then, Orman has put, published uh, 10 books total. She also mm -hmm. had the Susie Orman Show, which was on TV. It was on CNBC from 2002 to 2015. Um, and then in 2016, she was appointed the personal finance educator for the U.S. Army and the Army Reserve. Um, in 2018, she started serving as the special advocate for the National Domestic Violence Hotline um, in order to specifically address financial abuse uh, as, as one of the forms of domestic violence. Um, she currently hosts a podcast twice a week. Uh, it's Susan, Susie Orman, Women and Money is the name of the podcast. And um, lately, like super recently, people are turning to her. There's articles and blogs and stuff as people are trying to figure out what to do with these stimulus checks that have been coming uh, through wow. with the pandemic. So people are, you know, asking, what do I do? Should I put it all in a game what did stock she say? or whatever? <laughs> you know, so <laughs> she says, avoid the meme stocks. She's like, I know the Dogecoin is adorable. But no, she says, uh, avoid the meme stocks. Instead, she says, based on what we saw in 2020, she says everyone's number one priority right now should be having a 12 month emergency savings. She used to say three months, then six months. And then based on what we saw with the pandemic and how many people were literally out of work for a year, she says, your number one priority should be building 12 months emergency savings in case um, something like that happens again and we should be prepared for that wow that's yeah. good advice <laughs> yeah um i think of a lot of people caught out by that weren't they yeah. yeah so it's sort of that's all often like the number one thing that personal finance gurus talk about is this um this fund of money for a rainy day uh when times are good it's easy to forget about it mm -hmm. um, yep yeah. yeah, I really like this quote from, uh, from this book where Susie Orman says, we have to develop a healthy, honest relationship with our money. And we have to see this relationship as a reflection of our relationship with ourselves. And I think when we're talking about these like emergency savings kind of things, it's how safe do I want to keep myself? How secure do I want to keep myself? And there is some, um, some self-worth stuff that's kind of tied in there because to see money as just, well, it comes and goes and who cares what you're saying is the same thing about yourself, because then some, something like the pandemic hits you're without. And now that disregard you've had towards money turns into a disregard that you've had towards yourself. Um, and so I, that was one of the things mm -hmm. that I really liked about this book was just tying it all together and saying like, this is a form of self-care, like financial um, stability is a, it's stress relief and it's security for your future. So. Yeah, that's something um, actually I, I take from your, from your Instagram, Angie and RJ, is that there's the sort of emotional aspect of it, um, which I really like. Um, yeah, so yeah. How, how can people discover you and, and find out more about you? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, definitely connect with us on Instagram. Um, you can follow us at Rich by Intention. Um, we're actually at Rich by Intention on all the major platforms, Facebook, Twitter. Um, so definitely look out for us. Yeah, and then also uh, you can check out our website, uh, richbyintention.com. Uh, that's where you can find some of our blogs uh, and all 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 the ways that you can contact us and be on the lookout for the rich by intention podcast. So we'll be launching a podcast pretty soon ourselves. Um, 
you know, just sharing, you know, inspiring stories of women, couples, um, men, um, just people who've done great things in their careers, in their life um, to just, you know, encourage our listeners. So, yeah, yeah. We'll be discussing money, parenthood and career. So uh, look out for that. That'll be available on all major podcast platforms, Rich by Intention. That's great. Thanks, guys. Absolutely. And we'll be sure to include links in the show notes so everyone can get connected with you via Instagram and the other platforms for now and be on the lookout for the podcast. That's great. Um, And as always, for more book insights, you can follow us on all the socials as well at Book Insights Pod on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that good stuff. And then we're on YouTube as well. If you want to watch the interview or on all the podcast platforms, you can give us a listen. So thank you for joining us for today's Book Lounge episode and hope you'll join us next week for a new book of the week. All right. Thanks, Angie and RJ and Tom. Thanks, Thanks, guys. So much fun. Thanks. Thanks.